Easy way out. That's the nothing personal word of the day for Tuesday, February 20th, 2024. Easy way out, as in Mike Trout telling us, hey, if I wanted the easy way out, I would just ask to get traded. This is not a great time to be a fan of the Los Angeles Angels of Anaheim. You are heading into spring training with no Shohei Otani. You feel as though you have really turned the corner because you assigned Aaron Hicks. And then you wake up, it's media day, and everything hits the fan. Before I start getting into the Los Angeles Angels, if you're watching live on Nothing Personal with David Sampson YouTube channel, you will notice the festive out of rotation shirt. I have a separate shed of shirts. Uh, 4869. Say that five times quickly. I have a separate stash of shirts that are to the left of the normal rotation. Today, I am celebrating Will Manso's 49th birthday. You may know him in Miami as the channel ABC WPLG sports anchor. You may know Bryce Johnston from Survivor 28, does a great podcast, the Purple Pants podcast, does a bunch of things with Survivor and reality TV. You may know John Silverman, the greatest clubhouse manager in the history of baseball. And what do those three people have in common? Yes, sir, it's their birthday. So happy birthday to you, Will and John and Bryce. And I wore the special festive birthday shirt because I'm in a festive mood because when it's their birthday, that means we're under a week from my birthday. Big birthday coming up, Coca. Lawrence Taylor. Lawrence frickin' Taylor. So spring training starts. You meet with your PR people. There's a head of communications. Then there's people who run business PR. There's people who run baseball PR. Baseball PR, their main responsibility is to facilitate interviews between players and media. Sometimes you've got national media during spring training. You have ESPN. They stop at every place. You've got your local network. Then you've got your local broadcast networks. You've got the writers for the papers. You've got national writers. They make requests through the PR department. Then the PR department puts a puzzle together. Some players meet a bunch of media at a time in a scrum. Some people are granted one-on-ones depending on their importance in the market. Sometimes you're on cam, sometimes off cam, notes only. For the veterans, once in a while, we'll let them skip a rotation in the, in the spring training workout prior to games for them to meet the media. But right in the beginning of camp, you are working through the logistics and then you're talking message points because your owner meets the media and we've covered a lot of these so far. Then your players, your manager meets the media every day. So that is not as noteworthy. There's no sort of big preseason manager media because they are with them every day. But owners, players, presidents, this is your time. We want to start building excitement. March during spring training games is historically the best month for new season ticket purchases. There is a bump whenever you sign a free agent, a bump that never represents what you're paying the free agent, contrary to what agents think, but it bumped nonetheless. But as the season gets closer and you've got NFL over and you've got the NBA heading toward its playoffs and you sort of know where your city's team is, it is a big time to start and finish, really, your season ticket push. Season tickets are the lifeblood of the baseball gate revenue. They are guaranteed revenue, whether people go to games or not. So we sit with the players, we talk about things that are going to come up. When you sit with Mike Trout of the Angels, Mike, you know what's coming up. One, LAO. That is the number one thing people are going to ask about. Life after Otani. Two, LOP. Lack as a playoff team. They don't make the playoffs. In Trout's entire multi-MVP career, they've made the playoffs once. He hasn't won a damn playoff game. Not one. This man used to be the best player in the game. Not one. Imagine the best player in any sport not being a playoff participant. It's unheard of. It's why baseball is so hard. 
Three, your future. Those are the things they're going to want to hear, Mike. I'd like you to give it some thought. Let's workshop. Let's think of some messages about how you feel about life after Otani. You can be honest. You loved playing with him. You were honored to play with him. At the end of the day, we need to do more winning here. That is a message that I would love for you to give to the media, Mike, if you're willing to. Lack of playoffs. I'd like you to say, hey, we have an owner who spends. We have an owner who tries. We just haven't gotten the right formula here, but I am confident that we will get it together here in Anaheim right now. Can you do that? All right, what about you? What about your future? Well, Mike said, let me just tell you what's in my mind here. The easy way out is just to ask for a trade. There might be a time, maybe. I really haven't thought about this, Horsaki. But when I sign that contract, I'm loyal. I want to win a championship here. The overall picture of winning the championship or getting to the playoffs here is a bigger satisfaction than bailing out and just taking the easy way out. So that's my mindset. Mr. Trout, can we wordsmith that just a tiny, tiny bit, if that's okay? Can we talk about the team that's been put together? Can we talk about the effort that's been made? Can we talk about Ron Washington and the impact that he's going to have as the new manager? Can we talk about the advantage of having the players in this clubhouse with your leadership and your desire, which has never been any bigger than it is right now to carry this team to the playoffs and bring this city a championship and you're ready to do it right now and you're going to stay here as long as it takes? Can we try that on for size? Well, it's funny you asked me to say that, but I'd like to say just one more thing. Tell me what this would sound like if I said this to the media. During this offseason, I was in contact with both the owner and the president, and I've been pushing, pushing, pushing. There are some guys out there that can make this team a lot better, and I'm going to keep pushing as long as I can until the season starts. I'm doing everything I can. Mike, Mike, Mike. What you're really saying is that you reported to spring training, you looked at the clubhouse, you said hello to Aaron Hicks, and you looked around and said, God, do we suck. Then you looked at your win total and said 72 and a half. Crikeys. Is there any chance you won't say that, Mike? Well, I got to tell you, I'm the veteran of the group. Been here a long time. Very frustrated though no one forced me to sign that $400 million extension. All of that said, I've had an opportunity to be traded and I've chosen not to because I want the easy way out. I like Mike Trout a lot. He happens to be a great guy. He doesn't want to be the face of baseball. He just wants to be a baseball player. One baseball player does not a team make. You can have two of the top five players on a team and not make the playoffs. See Anaheim, comma, Los Angeles. I just don't ever want my best player on the first day of freaking camp telling the entire world that our team stinks and that we ought to get one of these last forest free agents to really make this a go. How did Boris and his free agents work with the Anaheim Angels? I would have said, hey, Mike, it's Dave. I've been your team president for a couple of years. Just do me, do me a solid. And just look a little bit to your left. Let's do it together. Ready? On three. One, two, three. Who do you see? Who do you got? David, you know who that is. That's Anthony Rendon. Yeah. How are we doing with him? He stinks. Mike, do you know what he's getting paid? Um, not really, Dave. I don't count other people's money, but I think it's about $38 million since you signed him to that seven-year deal. It was the greatest deal. He won a world championship with the Nationals and already gave him seven years, 245 million, and we were rolling, baby. Mike, are you aware that Anthony Rendon has not played more than 58 games in any of the four seasons he's been with us? Yeah, I don't see him around much. Hey, hold on, Mike, Shh. he's talking to the media. There's no way he's gonna say anything other than, I look around this clubhouse and I can't wait to help out and participate in turning this franchise around and winning my second ring. Hold on, let's listen for it. I think he's about to say it, Mike. Wait, what? What? Get someone over there. 
That's what I would do. I've done that so many times in a clubhouse where I'm listening to different interviews and I've got sort of the PR interns, get over there and stop that. Pull that fire alarm. Start walking around naked. Do something. Anthony frickin' Rendon, the Scott Boris guy, decided that this would be a good opportunity to remind all of his great fans and the lovely people of Anaheim that baseball has, quote, never been a priority for me and that he plays the sport to make a living. So what you're expecting me to do now is to tell you that Anthony Rendon is an absolute POS and that I've never heard of such a thing. And it's absolutely outrageous that anyone thinks that. But true connoisseurs of nothing personal, those who have been there from the start, know that I could swipe Anthony Rendon's name out of there and put Derek Jeter's name in there. I could swipe Derek Jeter's name out of there and put myriad player names in there. Just as I've said to you, do you love what you do every day? If you won the lottery, would you keep doing what you do? If you had a way, a way, a way, a way, a way. If you had a way to make more money doing something else, would you do it? If someone said that I'll give you a million dollars a year, but you're going to have to scoop up dog crap. I would say, give me that shovel. It doesn't matter if you like what you do. People can choose love or they can choose money. If you get both, good for you. One of them lasts, one of them doesn't. Here's the difference. Keep your yapper shut. You never heard Derek Jeter talk about the fact that he didn't like baseball? Why would he? Derek Jeter was a star for the New York Yankees playing shortstop, winning World Series rings. Once in a while, he let slip that he didn't watch much baseball during the playoffs or after they were eliminated or before, during the course of a season, didn't really know players. Big deal. He got a pass because he was playing his heart out. Every game. Rarely hurts. If you're a player like Anthony Rendon collecting $245 million and you've chosen an agent, here's a newsflash. Any player who has Scott Boris as an agent is interested in only money. And I am not ever going to sully or impugn any of the intentions of a player who chooses Scott Boris. You know exactly what you're getting, do it. It's like going to a brothel in Nevada. If you're going there because you want a conversation about politics, you may have chosen the wrong place. If you choose Scott Boris as your agent, you are trying to extract the last nickel and you do not care where you play. So that's fine. Rendon has him as an agent. He signs with the Angels, 245, and then stinks. Boris ain't spending time with Rendon trying to get him better, trying to figure out how to get him into the Boris lab to fix all that ails him because the money's guaranteed. But you would think he'd be smart enough to not let people know and guarantee what they had feared and hoped wasn't true. Because when you're Anthony Rendon, you can look at him and say, ooh, I'm not sure this guy's too committed. I'm not sure this guy looks like he wants to be here. I'm not sure this guy's doing anything but collecting a paycheck every two, every two weeks. And believe me, once those paychecks start in April 1st, there are 12 paychecks. Hurry up, do the math. That's a little over $3 million every single paycheck. There were times, Coca, there were times, those were the times that we loved. I would go to payroll just because I wanted to. Do you ever get in that way? Coca knows what I'm talking about, where you just want to wallow in self-misery and you want to make things worse than they are, even though you could choose to make them better and you go full glass, half empty. There were so many times that I would go into payroll. I'd go into the finance side and I'd say, show me the check run. Let me see the check run. Oh my God, we're paying that player so much money. He sucks so bad. Oh my God, this is the worst signing we ever did. I can't believe we can't get rid of him. Oh my God, what's wrong with me? I'm going to get fired. Oh my God, our team stinks. Show me again the check run. That's true. How about Anthony Rendon's check run? I would give, I never thought to do this. If I ever run another team, I'm going to supply nose plugs to our accounts payable department and our controller and to me, the team president, 
I'm going to put the little nose plugs on P.U. when I'm looking at some of the checks that are being cut. Maybe goggles because my eyes are going to water from the misery. Now, I'm not going to give Rendon even one ounce of anything by saying, oh, it's all about family and faith. My family, my faith, my family come first before this job. This is a job. I do this to make a living. Fine. I'm not saying you can't have faith. I'm not saying you can't have family. What I am saying is you've got a job. And I've gotten in plenty of trouble for saying this, but it's really hard to be the best you can be at your job and be the best you can be as a family, man, woman, or there. There are people who say they do everything to the best of their ability. They're saying that there's the best father and the best team president. Never met one. The best father and the best baseball player. Haven't quite met one yet. The best CEO of a Fortune 500 company and the best dad who ever lived. I'm a stay-at-home dad. I'm a stay-at-home mom. And I've got a $10 million a year job. Huh, haven't met that person either. And it's not to say that one is more important than the other at all. I'm all in. Be the best at one of them. Be mediocre at both of them. Be crappy at both of them. Your life, your choice, live and let live. But do me one small favor. And when you are being paid by somebody else, don't rub their face in the fact that you don't want to be there, that you don't care about being there, because you will lose your job if you're not named Anthony Rendon. If you're not a professional athlete and your boss has a belief or a thought, that, hey, you're only half in, less than interested. You're not going to be long for that position because there's a lot of people who will replace you who will be way more dedicated and devoted to one side of their life. And as a boss, we pretend, hey, we bring your kid to work day. Not a big fan. Take it, take, yeah, leave early, go to your kid's soccer game. Not a fan. Take time off. You want to take time off? Take time off. Does it make me a bad person? When I was running a team, when you're running a business, when you're the CEO, it would be like Coca telling me, hey, sorry, at eight o'clock, I know we're live, but I got to take my nephew, who he is the best uncle, one of the best uncles I know Coca is, I got to take my nephew to school. Nope, we have a job at eight o'clock. This is what we do. Does it mean that I'm an A-Rod? I just don't appreciate what Rendon did. And the Angels' ownership has to look at it, and they're looking for any way possible to get rid of him. And this isn't new. In September of 2023, this is five months ago, we have an open wait to see that Anthony Rendon will not be an Angel in 25. He's got this year and two more, $38 million each year, three more years. At the end of this year, the Angels are going to look and they're going to say, you know what? There's no more juice, and I'm damn tired of squeezing. See you later, Anthony. These players, they talk. Of course, when the owners talk, there's more prep. They're more willing to sit and rehearse and go through Q&A and practice and workshop. Tom Ricketts is the owner of the Chicago Cubs. Chicago Cubs had a player on their team last year named Cody Bellinger. Cody Bellinger took a one-year deal, like a one-year pillow deal, because he had basically been non-tendered by the Dodgers, former MVP, former MVP. Had to get his career back as he headed into free agency. Again, he hasn't signed anywhere yet. His agent, as you know, along with the other top three free agents who are still unsigned on February 20th, Blake Snell, Matt Chapman, Jordan Montgomery, and Cody Bellinger. Not signed. Tom Ricketts was asked about Cody Bellinger because Cubs fans are wondering what's happening. Do we have an offer out? Are we going to bring him back? Are we doing anything other than paying Craig Council $8 million a year? Is bringing him over from Milwaukee, is that the great coup d'etat? I wonder if people in Milwaukee, hey, my Milwaukee family, are we over Craig Council yet? Are we still defacing his park, his youth park in Whitefish Bay? Are we good? 
Are you realizing that your Milwaukee team is rebuilding and that there was no reason to pay Craig Council market rate? Oh, no, you signed Woodruff? No, you're rebuilding. I haven't spoken to Yelly about that fact. Can't be happy. So Tom Ricketts was asked, tell me about Cody Bellinger. Are you ready to pay up? And he was asked about his dealings with Scott Boris. And Tom Ricketts said, I don't talk to Scott. One of his signature moves is to go talk to the owner. I've told you that. You've learned that on this show. When you do that, you undermine the credibility of your GM. NSS, baby. Inserting yourself into that negotiation, I don't think that helps. I don't talk to him. Horse hockey. There is no player who Scott Boris represents who signs with any team where he doesn't speak to the owner and or the team president. It does not exist. Scott Boris will not cut a deal with just a GM or an AGM, heaven forbid. The reason why he wants to speak to owners is he can manipulate owners into saying, hey, one more, one more guy. You got to get this guy. You have no idea the difference you're going to make. I'm going to show you a book that presents the number of season tickets you're going to sell if you sign Cody Bellinger right now for six years and $180 million. Trust me. Trust me as his hand is down your pantalonis. Of course, Tom speaks to Scott. But then Rickett said something interesting. There have been some discussions, but it hasn't become a negotiation yet. Until they are ready to negotiate, there's not much we can do. We just have to wait for when it gets serious before talking about what the end money amounts are. Time out. Let me explain. All right, we're almost at break. It's too long. Let me summarize. Anytime you speak to an agent, you are negotiating. When Scott Boris calls you and says, my guy wants seven years, 30 a year, 210 million, he's negotiating. What you respond is, that's not an area where we are comfortable. We don't view Cody as a $200 million seven-year player. That was the old Cody. This is the new Cody. That's negotiating. Scott Boris then says, listen, we're not budging. 210 over seven. I don't know what he's asking, but let's just pretend that's what he's asking. I'm not moving. And the Cubs say, great, call us when you move. Do you think there's no communication that goes on for weeks and weeks and weeks and months? You backdoor it like you're in a movie studio. You're talking to the people who work for Boris. You're talking to players who are friends with Cody. You're having people down the chain in your baseball organization talking to people in various other teams, various other writers. You are working it because if you want a player and you want a player at a number and you're not close, you're finding ways to bridge a gap. You're getting word back to Scott. Hey, listen, we'll go all the way to April. We don't care. We'll go to May. We're good. We will never go. Get the message to him. We will never go 210 over seven. We won't go 125 over five. Let's get back to the table, which is code for let's text again. Let's speak again. And that's code for let's speak at the highest level again. The reason why these players have not signed is that no owners are giving in to Boris yet. And all they got to do is hold on. Hold on, Tom. You've got this. You can do it. Scott Boris is funny. You can tell he's getting a little panicked and that makes me happy. I like seeing him sweat. I like seeing sort of the Botox wear off and it gets a little wrinkly. He recently said to ESPN, free agency is about recruiting players. It's the normal owner's signature move to be involved in the efforts of recruiting players and reaching out to me so I can convey to the player the ownership of that team covets them. That's the essence of free agency. Let me just stop you there, Scotty Boras. That's not the essence of free agency. The essence of free agency is that a player has earned the right after six years of service time to choose the location of his services. He can choose where he wants to live. But 
the other essence of free agency, which you fought for as a union and which we granted you after a long and arduous negotiation, is that, like in love, where there's not major transactions involved, it takes two to tango. You cannot force yourself onto somebody. You want to play for the Angels? You can't force the Angels to want you as a free agent. There has to be mutual interest. The way mutual interest is born is when both sides of a deal see value. Both sides. The way players see value is they look around and say, oh, I can't get more than from this team. But really, I'd rather go to that team. What's the most I can get from that team? These are the discussions that take place starting before the season ends, before the free agents are actually free agents. That is what tampering is. You are trying to gauge your market and you are trying to match the market and your value. When owners and the signature move, we did it. We had an owner, signature move, calling Jose Reyes at 1201. Guess what was signature about that move? It involved an overpay. Here's a signature move. An owner got involved with another free agent. How do we get that one? Overpay. When owners get involved with free agents and emotion gets involved, it's an overpay. That's why Scott wants you to believe that's the normal way that an ownership shows love and coveting like you're some asset. Oh, we can't live without you. There are owners who actually say it, and Scott knows it. There are players where the owner will go to the president and say, David, I cannot live without this player. I don't want to own a team without this player. Shh, don't say that to anybody. We will not have any leverage. Don't worry, I already offered him the world. All right, let's sign it. Maybe it'll fail as physical. I'm slightly concerned that there is going to be a big fight coming at the end of this collective bargaining agreement, which expires 26. The reason I'm concerned, and we have years to talk about this, and Coca has assured me that he has no birthday party for his nephew at 8 a.m. any day soon, plenty of years to discuss this. But one of my concerns is that if Scott Boris and the players in the union believe that there is a concerted effort to eliminate Scott Boris and his players or to undervalue Scott Boris and his players, Scott Boris has the power in the union, despite what the union says, hear me now and listen to me later. The power of Scott Boris and that union is palpable. There is going to be a fight that will make the 99-day lockout from this past collective bargain agreement look like child's play. Speaking of fights and child's play and children, when we come back, we're going to review a movie, the directorial debut by Eva Longoria, nominated for an Oscar, not her, but the song in the movie, but that still counts, called Flaming Hot. And then we'll get to talk about another Boris client who spoke. Thank God Juan Soto spoke to the press. Teammate of teammates wants everyone to know, hey, everything's going to be all right. Maybe. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Nothing Personal. Hope you're enjoying my birthday shirt, unless you're listening to this. It's not my birthday today. Happy birthday, Will and Silver and Bryce, February 20th. I feel a little weird today because I'm such a creature of habit. And I went to an out of rotation shirt. And so I'm sweating a little more. It, I don't like the collar rests on me. It's very, it's very funny. People get, you know, when you have a habit, you have a habit. It's what it is. I guess there's medicine for it, but I dig it. I don't mind it. I watch a movie every day. I have started. Can I announce my new binge, Coca? We, have we announced it yet? I don't know whether we have or haven't, but I'm about to. I sent out a tweet at David P. Sampson. Thank you all, by the way, for all of your support of Nothing Personal, for just spreading the word. More and more people talk to me about how they're listening to Nothing Personal. More and more people in the industry. It would shock you the number of teams who are listening to it. Maybe it wouldn't shock you, but it makes me uh, work harder and uh, be thankful. So I don't have the first idea where we were. I do not. I lost my place here, Matt. Have we done the review yet? 
We have not. Okay. Oh, I'm announcing what I'm binging. Thank you. Golly. Hi, my name is David Sampson. All right, we're clear. Stroke test alert on a Tuesday. The leftovers. That's my choice. I'm just about done with season one. There's 28 episodes. I'm on the 10th episode of season one, which is the finale. And then I've got 18 more after that. And it started slow for me, but wow. The addiction is back, baby. I went like a week because I finished Lost on February 12th. We're eight days later, and I only waited four days or so before starting my next binge because all of you had such great ideas. It was uh, The Wire, Oz, and The Leftovers were the top three, and I went with Leftovers. But in the meantime, I also watch a movie. So I'm going down my list of Oscar movies, and on my phone, I have the Oscar, it's literally a note on my phone in the notes called Oscar movies to watch. And then when they start streaming. So for example, today, Zone of Interest nominated for Best Picture, Best Farm, Best Director. It starts streaming today. Huh, I wonder what movie I'm gonna watch today. And then Poor Things starts a week from today. And then Perfect Days a week after that. Anyway, I've got a list when they stream, when I can watch them. Because as you have heard, I'm going to try to watch everything prior to our Oscar coverage, both here on Nothing Personal and with Metal Arc, because there's a chance we have some special Oscar coverage as part of the Levitard show. But I'll believe that when I see it. It came right with my invitation to the Circa. So I watched this movie, Flaming Hot, and I had no idea. I did a lot of work with Pepsi and PepsiCo. The president of Pepsi when I was negotiating for our new ballpark and naming rights deal, and they ended up doing a quadrant, not the naming rights. It was a guy named Massimo, Massimo Diarte. You can Google it. His name was Massimo. He was just terrific to negotiate with. I went up to the PepsiCo headquarters in, I think they're in Purchase, New York. They have great art installations. It's an amazing group. They own Frito-Lays and a bunch of other, um, liquids and, and it's just an amazing company. They used to do the Super Bowl halftime. You've heard of Pepsi. Well, one of the brands that Pepsi has is called Frito-Lay. And I tend to enjoy my Fritos from time to time. One thing that I don't eat are Cheetos. And I'd like you to take a wild guess why I don't eat Cheetos. Coca, what would be your number one reason that I don't eat either Puffy Neither puffy nor crunchy Cheetos. If you had to take just a wild guess, what would it be? What do you got, Coca? Anybody? Because, oh, you nailed it. The cheese residue on your fingers. That is why I will not eat. I love that you know me, Coca. That's why I don't eat Cheetos. I was therefore not aware that there was a product called flaming hot Cheetos. And I love spice even before my taste and smell issues. I always love spice. I've always loved spice. But there is no amount of greatness that would ever overcome my desire to not have cheese residue on my fingers. Now, if they're in a bowl, would I take a spoon and take a spoon and get a puffy Cheeto? I would do it with the puff Cheeto balls because you can use a spoon, but then you get the orange around the lips and that drives me insane. So I eventually came to the conclusion that I would not engage in Cheetos in any way. Little did I know the story behind Flaming Hot Cheetos is freaking awesome. Little did I know after watching the movie that it may not be totally true, but let's pretend that Flaming Hot is true. It's a story of a Mexican man who decided that he wanted to be more than a janitor. So he said, why don't I bring all of my Mexican family and friends together, get all of the real chilies that I can find in wherever I lived, and let's see if we can make a sauce, stick it on a Cheeto, convince them to make it, and then see if they'll sell it. And lo and behold, Flaming Hot Cheetos became a multi-billion dollar product for PepsiCo. What an amazing movie. 
What an, what a great thing when someone wants it. They just want it. It's the anti-Rendon. They want more. They want to be better. They want to learn. And then you Google it, and it turns out there's a whole damn fight about whether or not he invented it. This guy, true story, ended up just retiring like in 2019, became a huge multicultural marketing guy for PepsiCo. How do we get our products into the hands of Mexicans, into the mouths of the Mexican people? It's a great movie. The song from it is nominated for an Academy Award. Enjoy Flaming Hot. Congratulations, Eva, on your directorial debut. So the Yankees are ready. Even if you're not a New York fan, the Yankees have reported Aaron Judge, year two of the big deal. John Carlos Stanton, back, thin. They did a whole thing in the New York Post. It's all over social media. Giancarlo Stanton reports skinny. He wants to turn his, he loves the idea of not being injured. He wants to be a World Series winning player. He cares about winning. Cares about it more than you know. Wants it more than you know. Wants a ring and then a second ring. Doesn't want to be hurt. I've been in the training room with Stanton when he comes out of a game hurt more times than I wish to mention. And there are some players who are on their phone and ready to do whatever they're doing, ready to go out, ready to go home. Stanton is seething, doesn't want to miss time. They've got a new teammate ready, a Boris guy named Juan Soto. Big trade. Remember when San Diego traded for Juan Soto from Washington? It was the biggest thing in the world because San Diego was all in. They were going to win it. They had everybody. Hey, we've got Josh Hader. We've got Juan Soto. We signed Xander Bogarts for $280 million. We've got Manny Machado. You want a big contract? We've got him. And I said they've got to cut their payroll, having nothing to do with Peter Seidler passing away, having to do with the fact that every owner wanted them to lose and they were losing money. So San Diego was getting rid of Juan Soto. It was a wait to see that I had that collected because it was so obvious. Who's going to trade for him? The Yankees. So Juan Soto puts on pinstripes as the ultimate rental. He's there for a year. Hal Steinbrenner knows it. Brian Cashman knows it. Juan Soto knows it. Scott Boris knows it. The Washington Nationals offered Juan Soto over $400 million and Scott Boris spit on it. My dream is that Juan Soto doesn't get more than $200 million ever from anybody because then it'll be another player who realizes that Boris doesn't give a crap about you, the player. He only cares about setting records for himself. There's just something amazing about the loyalty that some of these players have for Scotty Boy. Juan Soto meets the media, and he said, just here to play baseball. I'll let Scott Boris worry about free agency. He said about that free agent stuff and everything, I just let Scott do his thing. I have a lot of trust in him. Juan, I'd love to talk to you about that. That's one of the biggest things I have, that I just trust him so much, I forget about all that and just go play baseball. Horse hockey. I want you sleuths out there to go find out what happened in San Diego. And riddle me this. Do you think that Juan Soto may have been a slight bit upset that everyone had long-term deals in San Diego except him? Did that ever come up with any of the issues in the clubhouse? I'm just asking for a friend. Because Scott Boris puts in Juan Soto's mind, hey, you could have had 440, but you're going to get more. I promise you, you are getting more. And then all of a sudden, no one's offered him more. Oh, you just go out there and have a great year, and I'll get you more next offseason. Oh, well, it's next offseason. How'd we do? All right, you, you're on the Yankees now. The Yankees aren't going to let you go. They're going to want to resign you because we're going to win the World Series in New York. Well, he tells his other players, you're going to win the World Series wherever you sign. You're the last piece. You know how many times Scott tells teams, he's the last piece in your World Series puzzle? Hmm, only one team wins the World Series. I wonder if Scott really thinks that all the teams can win the World Series. I wonder whether owners should actually not listen to what he's saying. Juan Soto sitting in that clubhouse. Will he be an absolute nightmare in the Yankees clubhouse? Wait to see. Will the Yankees perform with Juan Soto? Will they get Blake Snell? Add him to the mix. Put him with Carlos Rodon, Garrett Cole, Aaron Judge, DJ. 
LeMahieu. Whoa, that's a team that's going to win it all in New York. We are New York. We are the New York Knicks. Oh, no, wrong one. Sorry. New York, New York. No, that's not it. What's the Frank Sinatra song? It's up to you. New York, New York. They play at the end of every game. I love when they play that. They lost game six of the World Series and still played that song. I sat there on the field singing that song, celebrating. GFY, Steinbrenner, we won. <sighs> Am I really this upset about Juan Soto? No. Everybody in the game knows. There's no more secrets, Madi. Everyone knows. Juan wants this long-term deal, and he turned it down, and he may never get that amount again. And of course, he's going to double down on his man, Scotty Boy, because Scotty Boy got him into this predicament. Brian Cashman is perfect. He delivered perfectly. The odds are this is a one-year situation. I don't see too many things stopping him from reaching free agency. There's only one thing differently he could have said, maybe. He could have said, I only see one thing stopping him from reaching free agency, and that's if we ridiculously overpay and we're not interested in that. That would have been awesome. There's only one way Juan Soto won't be a free agent. Scott told me himself. All you got to do is give him 500 for 10, and he'll be a Yankee. So true, there is something that could stop his free agency. NGTH, not going to happen. So the Yankees go in knowing they've got a year. It's a lot of pressure, isn't it? Putting Soto and Judge together at the top of the lineup, wondering if that is going to be the difference maker, hoping that they get pitching and that Cole somehow can be the Cy Young he was last year for one more year, hoping Rodon can be what he hasn't been, but maybe this year's his year. Maybe they fortify the rotation with another five and dive guy. Maybe they won't miss Aaron Hicks. They won't. Maybe Stanton doesn't get hurt. As a matter of fact, I'm going to do a little wait to see here. I'm going to do a double Yankee wait to see, Coca. Mark it. Make it official. Put it in the tracking document. One. Not only will Juan Soto, this isn't the wait to see yet. Not only will Juan Soto not sign a free agent deal while he's a Yankee this year, but I'm going to go even further. Juan Soto does not sign long-term with the Yankees. Wait to see. And in terms of my guy, Giancarlo Stanton, when he sets his mind to something, not many people mentally stronger than Giancarlo. Giancarlo Stanton will play in more than 120 games this year. There could be some nicks and some knacks, but he will play and he will produce. I could add a little bonus weight to see that it'll hit above the Mendoza line, but that's not fair. Of course he will. What was his average last year, um, Coca? I think he was below 200. Is that possible that Stanton last year was like 275 or, I mean, 175? I don't have it with me right now, but Coca may have it. I just don't know where he is and I can't hear him. He may be gone preparing the show already. But in either way, I'm going to say that my official wait to sees are that he at 191. Thank you. Official, he'll play in over 120 games and. I promise you, he will hit over 200 this year. He hit 211 the year before. All right. Can we make it a third way to see? Giancarlo Stanton hits, plays in more than 120 games and will hit higher than 211. There we go. A double way to see for Giancarlo, a single way to see for Juan Soto. All right. I can't tease it. Oh, I will do that, actually. We have to talk about it. All right, we didn't get to this, and I apologize. One of the things I wanted to do was something called the Horse Hockey Quote of the Day. Horse Hockey, which is one of our top-selling shirts on davidsampsonpodcast.com. Enjoy it. They're fun. Great conversation pieces. Thank you for the two people who, during the show just now, bought the Diamond Logo hoodie. It's cold out. Get those hoodies. And we have not dropped the 4869 yet. Working on it. But Horse Hockey Quote of the Day is when someone says something, and guess what? It's total horse hockey. Something happened with the Nationals today. We're going to talk about it tomorrow. I'm teasing it. I promise you we'll get to it. Don't worry. It's just business. Have a great day, and we'll be back tomorrow at 8 a.m. live. This is Nothing Personal. 